Alright, welcome back. Um, as promised in the C.S. Lewis video, um, I am going to talk about the poetry of Wilfred Owen today. And I was going to compare Wilfred Owen's war poetry, because that's what he's known for, for reasons we'll talk about in a second, uh, with C.S. Lewis's war poetry. But then it turns out that Lewis barely wrote any war poetry. He wrote poetry during the war that was about God and his absence and stuff. Uh, and only alluded to the war once or twice, whereas Wilfred Owen was, I think, understandably and rightfully consumed with the idea of the war that he was in. It really disturbed him, the nature of war in general, and he took to describing it in his poetry to just kind of to try to make people understand what was happening on the front lines. And he saw a lot of action and a lot of violence, and he ended up in a very similar experience to Lewis and a lot of other people, I'm sure. Unfortunately, he had a shell explode right next to him, kill his friend, and knock him unconscious for days. Uh, and he was just sitting on, like, a, in a trench or on, on, on the ground for, for days asleep or unconscious because of the shell that went off next to him. And he got shell shock from that and went to the hospital, and while in hospital, he met somebody named Siegfried Sassoon. And I have never read Siegfried Sassoon, and it's only now occurring to me that I definitely need to do it. It's mentioned, he's mentioned in a number of the footnotes here, uh, but he was also a poet during the war and was trying to explain the atrocities of it. And Wilfred Owen kind of was, I assume, somewhat inspired by him and kind of followed him around and they both went back into war after convalescing. Um, but sadly, Siegfried was killed a week before the armistice was signed, um, whereas Sassoon lived to be like 80-something. So I, I really am extra keen on reading Sassoon so that I can see what his poetry is and how it compares to Wilfred Owen's and then also see what happened to his poetry as he aged if he continued to write. Um, because we don't have that luxury with, with Wilfred Owen, although I wish we did, of course. Um, but he was, Wilfred Owen, and like, uh, as explained in the introduction to this lovely edition, um, edited by John Stallworthy, um, has beautiful little inside of the cover, and then a lot of great footnotes throughout, and a really long introduction, which I honestly didn't read all of, but I want to. Um, but I was too eager to get to the poems. But in this, it talks about how he was... He studied sciences as a kid and was interested in that, also interested in theology, coming from a religious family, but eventually was kind of disillusioned with religion in general. But most of what I am going to read, if not all, is just war poetry, like about the war, not about religion, but it does use religious language to discuss it, um, and then kind of calls out the church in instances as well. Um, so just keep that in mind. But honestly, I'm just going to start at the beginning and go through the ones I've earmarked, um, dog-eared here, um, with no particular order, just because they're all so powerful and poignant. <clears throat> Alright, so this one is called Inspection, uh, and it's talking about someone getting called out for having blood on his uniform and what thoughts that kind of conjures up in, in his mind. Let's see if I can get these voices right. Inspection. You, what do you mean by this? I rapped. You dare come on parade like this? Please, sir, it's... Hold your mouth, the sergeant snapped. I takes his name, sir? Please, and then dismiss. Some days confined to camp he got for being dirty on parade. He told me afterwards the damaged spot was blood, his own. Well, blood is dirt, I said. Blood's dirt, he laughed, looking away far off to where his wound had bled and almost merged forever into clay. The world is washing out its stains, he said. It doesn't like our cheeks so red. Young blood's its great objection. But when we're duly whitewashed being dead, the race will bear Field Marshal God's inspection. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, the next one I'm going to read is called Anthem for Doomed Youth. And it's talking about the things that will be, like, in this unceremonious mass of death that is war, 
the things that are going to be like the ceremony, the funeral ceremony almost of these of these young men. Anthem for doomed youth. What passing bells for those who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers, nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers the tenderness of patient minds, in each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. Mm, very powerful. Um, I, I think my favorite is probably the choir, and it sounds so hopeful, and then it's the choir of the demented wailing shells. But it, to explain this last line here, there's a lovely footnote, but it says that, I mean, the line is, in each slow dusk is a drawing down, or a drawing down of blinds. And it explains it over here on the next page, saying that drawing down the blinds of a house, now an almost forgotten custom, indicated either that a funeral procession was passing or that there had been a death in the house. So he's saying that each dusk is the world drawing down the blinds for all of those who had fallen in battle that day, if you will. But, yeah, anthem for doomed youth. <sighs> yeah. Um, this one's intense. 1914. War broke. And now the winter of the world with perishing great darkness closes in. The foul tornado centered at Berlin is over all the width of your world, rending the sails of progress. Rent or furled are all art's ensigns. Verse wails, now begin famines of thought and feeling. Love's wine thin. The grain of human autumn rots down hurled. For after spring had bloomed in early Greece, and summer blazed her glory out with Rome, and autumn softly fell, a harvest home, a slow grand age, and rich with all increase. But now for us, wild winter, in the need of sowings for new spring, and blood for seed. 1914. So, wow. Uh, Describing history and it's it's spring and summer and then autumn and then now we have winter. They have this this devastating war that is rending the sails of progress. Rent or furled all arts ensigns. Verse whales now begin famines of thought and feeling. Um, and I, I think that is an extremely accurate depiction of what like <laughs> postmodernism became and rightfully so after the atrocities of this war everyone was just so jarred um that postmodernism kind of came in and, and after the traumas of this war uh, and so i think we haven't recovered from that yet now begin the famines of thought and feeling and i think yeah really really crazy really intense poem all right so we got another one here this one is has a latin title and it's Apologia pro pomate meo, and that means in defense of my poetry. Uh, and as the footnote over here so helpfully says, um, it's tempting to see the poem as a response to a remark by Robert Gra in Robert Graves' letter, in which he said, For God's sake, cheer up and write more optimistically. The war is not ended yet, but a poet should have a spirit above wars. I just, I don't know who Arthur Graves is, or Robert Graves is, but I, I can't help but wonder if he was actually, if he was in the war. <laughs> I don't think he was. Uh, maybe he was, though, but anyway, he's telling Owen to write more optimistically. And so here, in the fence of his poetry, Wilfred Owen describes a lot of kind of positive sounding things and then tells the reality of them as he sees it. 
I too saw God through mud, the mud that cracked on cheeks when wretches smiled. War brought more glory to their eyes than blood, and gave their laughs more glee than shakes a child. Merry it was to laugh there, where death becomes absurd and life absurder, for power was on us as we slashed bone bare, not to feel sickness or remorse of murder. I too have dropped off fear, behind the barrage, dead as my platoon, and sailed my spirit surging light and clear past the entanglements where hopes lay strewn. And witness exultation, faces that used to curse me scowl for scowl, shine and lift up with passion of ablation, seraphic for an hour, though they were foul. I have made fellowships, untold of happy lovers in an old song, for love is not the binding of fair lips with soft silk of eyes that look and long by joys whose ribbon slips, but wound with war's hard wire whose stakes are strong, bound with the bandage of the arm that drips, knit in the webbing of the rifle thong. I have perceived such beauty in the hoarse oaths that kept our courage straight, heard music in the silentness of duty, found peace where shell storms spouted reddest spate. Nevertheless, except you share with them in hell the sorrowful dark of hell, whose world is but the trembling of a flare, and heaven but the highway for a shell, you shall not hear their mirth. You shall not come to think them well content by any jest of mine. These men are worth your tears. You are not worth their merriment. Whew. Wow. Um, so, a lot happening there. But I think of... I, I made fellowships. And he talks about how... The fellowships born are brought about by joy, whose ribbon slips, but his is with war is hard wire, uh, whose stakes are strong, bound with the bandage of the arm that drips. Um, so he has these, this lasting, this stronger fellowship forged in battle, uh, which makes me think of Lewis's uh, Guns in Good Company, his chapter from Surprised by Joy, um, where he talks about the, the friendships that he's made in the battlefield. Uh, but, yeah, High, or heaven is but a highway for a shell. I, I don't have much I can say about these besides, wow. Alright, this one, I don't know if I can pronounce this word, but it's a river. I think it's called Ancre. Ancre is what I'm going to go with, but it's French, I think, so it's going to be something stranger than that. Uh, so it says, at a calvary near the Ankara, um, near this river. And a calvary being a cross, I think, like a crucifix. And in this, he's going to talk about the beast, which is, of course, uh, like Germany, the antagonist of the war. Um, and then he also talks about uh, flesh marked, and those are just battle wounds, of course, uh, which might be spoiling things, but I'll read it now. One ever hangs where shelled roads part. In this war he too lost a limb, but his disciples hid apart, and now the soldiers bear with him. Near Golgotha strolls many a priest, and in their faces there is pride that they were flesh-marked by the beast by whom the gentle Christ denied. The scribes on all the people shove and brawl allegiance to the state, but they who love the greater love lay down their life they do not hate. So I might read those last two again, last two stanzas. Near Golgotha strolls many a priest, and in their faces there is pride that they were flesh marked by the beast by whom the gentle Christ's denied. The scribes on all on all the people shove and brawl allegiance to the state, but they who love the greater love lay down their life they do not hate. And this is an interesting one, because of course he's saying these these priests 
were in battle against Germany and they're proud of their war wounds. And like you think rightfully so, because you, like, you needed to go to war to stop the atrocities. Um, and, and so they are proud of their war wounds. However, in this being World War One, they um, there is a complication in, in Owen's eyes. He, he says in the footnote here, or the, the editor says, uh, the church sends priests to the trenches where they watch the common soldier being, as it were, crucified, and they take pride in minor flesh wounds as a sign of their opposition to Germany, the beast. Flesh marked, however, carries a further meaning. The devil used to be believed to leave his finger marks on the flesh of his followers. Um, see Revelation. Thus, the church's hatred of Germany puts it in the devil's following, and the priest's wounds are signed not so much of opposition to the devil Germany as allegiance to the devil war. Whew. So, I mean, it was powerful enough to begin with, but I think it's more powerful uh, once we, we read that footnote. All right, so I guess we're concluding with my favorite poem of his, his most famous poem, of course. And that is Dulce et Decorum Est. Now, as you probably know, that means, I mean, sweet and fitting. It is sweet and fitting um, in Latin. And it's a, a reference to Horace. But the real, the full line of that is Dulce et Decorum Est pro patria mori. And so Horace is saying, it is sweet and fitting to die for your country. This kind of noble patriotism that we all are familiar with. Um, and that has swept up so many people on so many different sides of so many different battles. So it is sweet and fitting is what he's fighting against. And I'll say in advance that uh, he talks about five nines, and those are, are like cannon or shells, I believe, a, a size of shell. And he's going to be alluding to the, the gas, which I think is chlorine gas. So when you hear him talking about gr like green gas, that's what it is. And that was, of course, used in the trenches there. Although I think it was, like, technically illegal at the time, if I remember correctly, but they still used it. Or maybe it wasn't illegal yet. I, I, I shouldn't talk about things that I don't understand or don't know about. Anyway, so I'll read it now. Dulce et decorum est. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five-nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick with sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as a cut of vial, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie dulce et decorum est pro patria mori Ugh, i get goosebumps every time i read it it's just yeah such a, a vivid description you feel the distress I, I i don't have words for it i've never been there but you, yeah you can just feel a little tinge of what he was feeling, I think, hopefully. I assume that's what his point was, and I think he accomplished it because he's an expert poet. The pains that he talks about seeing, like through the misty pains, uh, the thick green light, that's the, the little eyes on his gas mask. Gas, gas, quis, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. 
dim through the misty panes, the thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. Men marched asleep. Lewis talks about that too. Marched asleep. Uh, many had lost their boots but limped on bloodshod. My friends, you would not tell with such high as death to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et coramest. Pro patria mori. I can't think of a better war poem. I can't think of one that I think is that powerful. But I haven't read Sassoon yet, as I said. Anyway, there's a little glimpse into Wilfred Owen. Wilfred Owen. Um, he's a really... He was a really gifted poet until he died at 25 in the trenches. Anyway, I thought that was maybe a fitting thing. Uh, the war in Ukraine is still going on. It's been like eight or nine months now. And I, I, I picked this up again when it started just to try to remember that though these atrocities are far away, they're still happening right now. Um, and yeah, it's something that we should keep in our minds, even though the news has stopped reporting it because it's old, old news. Anyway, sorry about the, the gloomy one, but I think that the power that he has in his poems, uh, is just amazing. So, hope you enjoyed that as much as you can enjoy war poetry. Uh, and maybe I'll come back sometime with Sassoon if I can find him on my shelves or buy him somewhere. Anyway, thanks for joining me again.